So again, good morning, uh, uh, church family. It is so good to be able to, uh, to see you, to be able to worship with you again this morning in Colton. So I'm so thankful that you've been kept uh, by the mercy of God, by his uh, graciousness, and that I've been kept as well. Certainly we live in some very trying times as well as testing times, and uh, we know that we're living in the end of the world, uh, which definitely goes without saying, but still we live here and we can see just the mercy of God, his long suffering, and we're very thankful for that. And as we get ready to, uh, to get into our studies for this morning, um, as we have prayer, uh, I, we will remember again, I think you mentioned Brother Eugene and also Sister Betty's family. I uh, don't remember the other persons that may have been um, spoken of, but we certainly will uh, we'll remember them in prayer. So as we start this morning, as we begin, um, we'll have prayer. And then, of course, when we conclude, we'll um, have our, our closing prayer just the same. So would you uh, bow your heads as we as we pray, please? <gasps> Father in heaven, I want to thank you again this morning for another Sabbath day that you let us see, uh, that you have kept us, you spared our lives, and uh, just given us so many different blessings. And we recognize that you opened up your hand and satisfied the desire of all the living creatures. And everything that we have at art it rightly comes from you. And we're just but stewards. And so we just want to put it all in that, back in your hands and put ourselves in your hands. We live in this wicked world um, that pulls us towards uh, sin and transgression a world that glamorizes the, uh, the breaking of your law, of being in rebellion against you, and uh, tramples down your holy precepts. And I pray, Father, that you would help us to shun the, uh, the world and its allurements, its attractions, its treasures. Uh, let our eyes be single to the glory of God and to his kingdom of righteousness. And I pray that, that, that not only would that be our desire, but that we also may want to transfer uh, that and to help others. Uh, for no sooner is a heart converted, is there like a, an impulse to try to help others toward the kingdom of God as well. So we pray that you would please be with us, forgive us of our sins. Uh, we, again, we're going to pray for Sister Betty with her uh, loss that she has with her son. Just comfort her and put your arms around her. Be with her during this time and her family right now. May they find strength and grace in you. Pray for also Brother Eugene, uh, that you would be with him. And we pray that whatever he has uh, that in his body, that you would bring healing just let your will be done. Bring him back up off of his sick bed again to restore him to uh, his fa uh, family and church family. And we pray for any of the other requests as well. And we just know that you're going to be with us in a special way. And we just ask and claim for the blessing of your presence because we confess our sins um, in Jesus' name. We ask for his cleansing blood and we pray for your grace and the Holy Spirit this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. amen. Um, for our, our topic this morning for, for Sabbath School, we're, we're studying uh, Bible Study 101. And the call to that, I know some of the things we'll, we will review will probably be familiar with you that you have looked at before. And some things will be um, new for you, perhaps. But it, not, whatever the case is, whether it's new, whether it's a reminder, well, we're certainly going to be able to look at that. So uh, we'll, we'll look at that uh, Bible Study 101. So I want to start with two prefaces, um, or premises this morning. First, you know, um, why do we study the Bible? Then how do we study the Bible? And um, as I as I considered that and I thought about it and have reviewed and prayed, I've, I've been brought to the realization that a lot of the the methods that I have implored um, and sometimes the reasoning has not necessarily been uh, you know Bible based. It's not it's it's not been from a biblical perspective. Many of them have been, but some have not been. And I'll share those with you. And so maybe you may be able to identify and say, you know what, yeah, I can identify to see that in my own life. And sometimes it's also from the perspective of of trying to be able to establish and, um, and to, to emulate uh, others that may be esteemed. And so I know that particularly there are some that are newly come to the faith. And sometimes we'll hear others leading out and others teaching and so forth, and, uh, hearing their uh, expositions from scripture and like, okay, well, hey, I want to be able to have that as well. I want to be able to understand that. And I don't see that, you know, I, I read the same passage of scripture and I couldn't get any of those things out. And they read it and they came back with just a treasure trove of information. And I read it and I only came back with like one, one or two things, you know, and why, what's wrong with me? How did they get eight points out of that? And I only got two pieces of, uh, you know, information of things that stood out to me. And it could become a, a, a situation whereby unwittingly, we begin to compare ourselves amongst ourselves and desiring uh, and, and, and sometimes could be reaching for something that may not be there um, for us. So let's first look at the scriptures and be able to, to understand, because, again, there's a, a reason why God grants us 
these things is given to us his word and so why do we study the scriptures so if you turn first of all to the book of john uh, saint john chapter five and i'm um, gonna ask uh I'm trying to i think switch over so i can share my computer or has some difficulty logging in so i think i'm coming in on the other side here Now we're going to John chapter five and uh, the Bible says in verse 39, St. John chapter five. And verse 39. So this is again what Jesus says uh, regarding the scriptures and the importance of them. St. John chapter five. five, 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 five. Okay, sorry, that's me connecting again on my computer. Uh, just for the point, purpose of being able to share some of the, uh, the screens with you. Uh, Jesus said in St. John chapter 5 and verse 39, he says, Search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and these are they which testify of me. And so that's the reason why, first and pr uh, primary, that we always want to search the scriptures because we want to find eternal life because the scriptures contain eternal life, meaning that they tell us about Jesus. They introduce us to a loving Savior. They show us uh, the God of the world dying for man, uh, re rescuing man from the depths of degradation, willing to transform our lives, to sanctify us by his spirit, to fit us for his coming. They show us the plan of redemption, uh, show us clearly the great controversy, all those things are seen and, and of course illustrated through the life of Jesus because why did Jesus come on this earth? He came to give us the perfect example to not only be our substitute, but also to be our surety, to, um, to set an example for us to, as to how we can live as we surrender our lives over to him, how we could be transformed by his grace, to know how to go and be involved in ministry to others, to have compassion, to exercise justice, to also to, uh, to when to be able to bring forth mercy, when judgment needs to be brought forth, all of those things we see. And Jesus says that when we look in the scriptures, we need to be mindful of that because the reason why we search them is because these are the ones that tell us about eternal life. So do you know that there's really no other place that one can go to to be able to gain a knowledge of God and eternal life as is pertained in the Holy Scriptures? Every other book that is written upon the earth, you know, is granted, certainly uh, outside of the context of inspired scripture or inspired writings, they won't do that. They'll be able to illuminate us. They'll be able to, to help us. They'll maybe prompt us. But none of them have the magnitude as what the scriptures are given. But the Bible says, again, search the scriptures that Jesus said. Uh, for in them you think you have eternal life, and these are they which testify of me. So the scriptures are going to point us to God. That, so that is why we study. Uh, we don't study then to be able to show someone that we know something. Um, certainly we want to be able to be able to share our faith intelligently as we talk to others, but that's not the main purpose of when we go to the scriptures. The main purpose that we go to the scriptures is because we want to be able to have an experience with Jesus. We want to be able to understand and to see him. And by seeing him, by beholding, then we become changed. So he gives us then the scriptures in for that particular reason. So that is where we go in and we begin to examine the scriptures because we want to be able to see and to know and to understand God for ourselves. Number two, our second thing we'll look at then is in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and verse 17. There the Bible says that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. The man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. So again, we're reminded that the purpose of scripture, every scripture is given for this purpose, that we might be uh, instructed. This is going to be sound, profitable doctrine or teaching. So it's not just thinking about the right thing, but knowing what is right, identifying what is wrong, and having then a, a, a barometer that, that sanctifies our mind to truth, to know this is what is right, this is what's wrong, this is what God is calling for us and expecting of us from his holy word. So all scripture is given by inspiration of God. And so it is uh, inspired by God. God breathed, God inspired, literally is what the, um, the, the Greeks suggest in that it is inspired. God breathed the scriptures given it to us. So this is not an opinion of man. This is not man's uh, thoughts on a particular subject matter, but rather it is the divine mind explaining and human symbols as best we can comprehend and grasp of the principles of God. Psalms 119 verse 105. Psalms 119, verse 105. Psalms 119, verse 105 says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. So why do we again study? We said the word because we want to be familiar. We want to walk in the light as Jesus is in the light. 
uh, our relationship with him, we grow by feeding off of the word of God as we study it, as we eat it now it becomes food and sustenance to us. It gives us hope uh, according to uh, Romans chapter 15, it gives us guidance, it gives us comfort in the scriptures, it gives us patience, all these different things builds up our faith as we see these stories that are uh, of similar men and women in similar trials that we have had. We sometimes we see their successes and we sometimes see their failures. In fact, that is one of the things that testifies to the authenticity of the scriptures is that it doesn't just show the good things of man, but it also shows man at his lowest points. You know, consider a person as, as King David. Now, Donald it talks about David's good thing uh, that he, David did, but it also shows us David's failures. If this was something that were written and communicated by man, then certainly would be a man in terms of giving a biographical sketch would certainly do the best he could to try to make sure that others did not see him in a bad light. You know, when a person may want to write about someone and they look up to a person, then they may want to minimize their blemishes. Uh, they want to give them a coat of paint so that they don't look um, as, as big warts to give it a, a, a revisionist version so that it does not make them look as bad. But when God begins to write, by the prophets, he pointed out again that what David did was wrong. What David did was a sin when he transgressed and took Uriah's wife, when he then planned and manipulated and murdered an innocent man, that God was not well pleased. And so God then says the standard that sin, wherever it is found, that it is grievous in his sight, it is offensive. So whether it come from one that at one point was a man after God's own heart, as the Bible says, as he walked in God's ways, as he followed his statutes. But then when he transgressed and God showed his displeasure. And so the scriptures give us that whole variety of, for us to be able to see if we do well, then we shall be blessed. If we don't do well, then we shall certainly bear the brunt of God. But God is certainly not a respecter of persons. Then we see in Psalms 119 and verse 9, Psalms 119 and verse 9, Psalms 119 division, verse 9, just a few verses back. It says, where wither shall a young man cleanse his way? How are we going to stay clean? How will a young man know which way to go in? How will a young lady trying to figure out, navigate through life? What direction shall I go in? You know, what is God's will for my life? What is this plan for me? You know, can I just go out and to enjoy life as, as it is presented? It says, well, how shall a young man know how to cleanse his way? And the answer is very clear. It says, by taking heed thereto according to the word. So these are not the inexhaustive expanse of scripture. Rather, just giving us uh, certain highlights that we want to look at is the reasons why we said it. We said it to be able to find Jesus. We said it to be able to understand his truth. We said it to be able to understand and to walk in the light as he is in the light. We said it to be able to share our faith with others and to be able to witness effectively. And all of those things, those are uh, some of them are, are, are products of it. Of course, it builds us up in the most holy faith. And it keeps us again from walking in transgression. For David said, thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. So the word is able to keep us from falling as we depend and we call upon God to help us in the hour of temptation. Again, this is not an exhaustive list as to why we study, but some of the, the, the primary reasons that we study. Notice that none of those things consist of the ability to be able to debate someone to prove a point. That's not the reason why we study the Bible, to debate somebody and to, to drive them in the ground. Uh, we don't study the Bible to be able to build our own egos. We don't study the Bible to be able to build monuments of pride unto ourselves. We don't study the Bible to be able to beat someone over the head. We study it because we want to be changed into the likeness of Jesus Christ. We study it because we want to, uh, to sense more of his presence, more of his likeness. And it's in the process of that that it helps us as we're willing and cooperate with the plan of God then to share then to the world. Uh, how are we then to study? Because we talk about why we study. Well, um, how then do we study? So I'm going to switch uh, screens now, and hopefully you'll be able to, uh, to see. Let me just uh, select this. All right, and so uh, hopefully you should be able to see. Okay, so this is how we talked about why we study, uh, but now how do we study the scriptures? And so we're going to pick up a little bit of, uh, of our pace here. In Luke chapter 24 and verse 27, and St. Luke 24 and verse 27, the Bible says, in the beginning of Moses and all the prophets that he expounded unto them and all the scriptures of things concerning himself. 
Now, I know that there are some uh, things of Scripture that we've identified in terms of how, uh, how we study, um, how we look at the Scriptures and so forth. Stop this. There we are. Uh, how we study, how we look at the Scriptures and so forth. But, it, but it's important to notice that Jesus, to, when he appeared again to his disciples, it says that he began at Moses and he expounded to them all the things in the Scriptures concerning himself. When we study them, brothers and sisters, it's important then to understand that there are different ways to study. Okay, um, and we're talking. We're going to look at some of this coming up. But one of the most important things is understand. Uh, there's a simple saying: that text without context is pretext for subtext. Okay, I'll repeat that: that text without context is pretext for subtext. Let me illustrate that for you in just a real-world scenario. Uh, suppose there are two people talking and you come into the room and you hear part of the conversation. Uh, and, and the part of the conversation that you hear, it will certainly give you an idea as to what they were talking about. Now, if you think about it, you would know or you should realize that because you picked up just a portion of the conversation, there could be the reality that you could misunderstand the total conversation, right? You know, you could come in and, and they are just at a small portion of a conversation and you hear a sentence. And if you leave out just with that sentence, you might have the complete uh, wrong idea as to what those two people are talking about. So, it, for instance, it could be a man talking to another man and he could be saying uh, that, you know, I'm thinking about uh, killing myself. OK, you come in, you hear that I'm, I'm thinking about killing myself. Instantly, you know, the uh, the antenna go up and you start thinking, you know, wow, you know, why is Joe thinking about killing himself? Let me start praying for him because he's, he's planning on killing himself. And you might even go out and tell somebody else that we need to do an intervention because Joe is thinking about killing himself. And you're like, well, how do I know? Uh, well, I heard it with my own ears that he said, I'm thinking about killing myself. Those were his exact words, quote, I'm thinking about killing myself. However, if you had heard the whole conversation, you may have missed or you would have heard the previous, the preceding sentence, whereby he may have said, I was talking to Billy and Billy said, I'm thinking about killing myself. And because he made that statement, these are the steps that we took to be able to make sure he had help. So you only heard like one, one piece of the sentence and what you heard, mind you, what you heard was true. Okay, but that was not the truth of the matter of what you heard. That was not the truth, that was just a portion of it. So, con so the context is important to be able to have what's going on, what's taking place around it, okay? The context is important. So text without context is pretext for subtext. It could carry us in the wrong direction than what was intended by the writer. Number two. Uh, so then as we study them, uh, we wanna be able to look at the, um, the, no, the context of uh, the, uh, the background um, and so that does not mean that like, what we call proof texting is wrong. But the Bible says in the book of Isaiah that line upon line, line upon line, precept upon precept, a precept upon precept, here a little one, there a little, certainly applicable is definitely a great way to be able to study. So you can study then um, different, uh, you comparing scriptures with scripture to see if there's a harmony throughout the scriptures. But again, generally as we study though, we want to keep in mind, let's look at the context, be able to understand it, and make sure that what we take it out uh, from a, a, a sentence, a paragraph, or two, that that's the context um, that it does split, that it does apply, and so that we are not doing the scriptures then in injustice in that in that light. So we understand then that we can uh, look at the entire uh, entire scriptures. Number two, the Bible says in the book of Luke, chapter ten, verse twenty-six, Jesus said unto him, "What is written in the law? How readest thou?" What's written in the law and how do you read it? How do you, what does it mean? So as we study the Bible then, is we read what's written in the scripture, but we also, then there's this thought process that goes through them that we, we begin to try to understand, okay, this is what's written, and then what does it mean? This is what it says, but what is the interpretation? What is the application? Um, the interpretation, what is it, you know, what does it mean? And then I can get the application. How do I apply it to myself? How do I apply it to this situation? What is the interpretation? What was it given? What was the context? You know, who was it written to? Why was it written? Uh, and somebody said, well, how can I understand all those things? I just want to be able to pick up the Bible and be able to read. Well, absolutely. As we pick up the Bible in sincerity, 
and we go to God and we pray, you know, God, help me to understand your word. Make no mistake about it. God will help us to understand. Okay, he'll, he will teach us. He'll teach us his word. The Holy Spirit is given to help us to understand his word. What I'm talking about here are uh, different principles that go along with it. So that as you begin to read, as you begin to study, there are tools to be able to have uh, at your disposal. But to keep in mind, again, the attitude is one of the main things that, that, that counts. You know, how we approach the scriptures with a reverential awe that here we're coming in to be able to meet with God. And we want him to speak to our minds, to speak to our hearts and to grant us understanding. So we approach it then with sacredness. We approach it then with holiness and with awe knowing that this is God of being able to speak. And Luke 10, he says, well, what's written in the law? How do we read it? So uh, not only do we read it, but then we must interpret it. So it's not just enough just to read the scripture, but we want to be able to interpret it. Okay, number uh, and, uh, three, Second Peter chapter 1 and verse 20. The Bible says, knowing this verse, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. We live in a world in which there are many different interpretations. There are lots of interpretations in the church, lots of interpretations outside of the church. But bear in mind again that in 2 Peter chapter 1, it, it clearly says that no prophecy of the scripture is given for private interpretation. And that's twofold. So number one, when prophets had the gift of prophecy, uh, when they received the divine gift, they did not share with people to profit themselves. So you wouldn't find a true prophet saying, you know, hey, pay me 10 bucks and I'm going to give you your, your fortune. Give me $100 and I'll tell you what the future holds. Uh, you know, I'll tell you who to marry, who not to marry, what school to go to, what school not to go to, what car to buy. That was not the, the, the delegation and the duty of a prophet. The divine dreams, the visions and revelations that God inspired by the prophets, it was to convey truth unto his people, to lead them to Jesus Christ. It was to be able to help them to understand of the plan of salvation, to be able to see uh, their interactions and he, uh, human uh, issues and so forth. And they were generally on a larger scale, a grander scale than a single person, but a great impact that it may make. So maybe a king and the impact that a king would make, but generally not a single uh, solitary individual as such. And then number two is as the prophets received vision and instruction, what they gained, that it was not to contradict what the, of the scriptures had given, not to contradict what the other prophets had seen. So a prophet, the Bible says in the book of 1 Corinthians, that the spirit of the prophets, they are subject unto the prophets. Thus prophets can't say or have a message that is contradictory to that of the other messages that other prophets have. And so that's the beauty of the scriptures. As we begin to read and understand it, that Moses, even though he did not know Paul, and Paul came some 2,500 years later on down, down the road, that Paul's teachings do not contradict Moses' teachings. And that Isaiah, uh, that he never met John the, the, uh, the Revelator. But John's teachings and Isaiah's teachings don't contradict one another. So that there's this harmony that is there because it is the Spirit of God that, that authored and guided the minds of men and women through thousands of years being able to communicate and to write the Scriptures. And, and you look at the, the beauty of it, you know, thousands of years of history passing in between, written on several continents, you know, Africa, Europe, and Asia, by different men and women at different times, and yet one harmonious message all throughout, and that is because God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so prophets had no, they were not for their own purpose, not building up an empire unto themselves, and so their revelation, again, is not a private interpretation. So our understanding of scripture is not to be in some private interpretation. So when we come up with the notion, with an idea then, we're told an inspiration uh, in the Bible and in the spirit of prophecy, then we're to be able to go and to share and to talk with others, uh, to be able to get counsel and guidance on it. And so, so a lot of times in the, maybe an idea may come to mind and the person wanted to, uh, to know, well, is that actual? You know, is that, is that true? You know, this is what I'm thinking because it is often the case that when we study, that we will say, um, this is how God has led me. And certainly I think that that is true. This is what we feel in our hearts and in our spirits. But I think if we're all honest with ourselves, we recognize that there are different things that we have taught or embraced or believed, taught others. And we thought and believed at the moment that what we shared, that it was true, that it was vital, because we come to that conclusion from our searching of the scriptures, sometimes just by repeating what other people have said. But then as time has gone on, we've been able to look by the weight of evidence and in God's mercy, we've been able to see that, okay, you know, I, I did believe that that was true, but now I can see that that is not true. And this is not solely or exclusively in relation to, quote, 
coming out of other churches and their teachings and so forth. And I'm specifically talking and addressing, even with our own experience now, in the last five years, 10 years, year, whatever the case may be, we may have formally embraced things and we believe that, okay, well, this is what the scripture is teaching. But then when we did a further investigation of it, we found uh, now and confirmed, confirmed through the Bible, through the spirit of prophecy, that the belief then that we held, that it was not accurate. So we abandon that, we give that up. And that, again, that's a process then of setting of learning. And so that's why the Bible says, again, it's not of any private inter interpretation. So the searching of the scripture is not of any private interpretation. John chapter 16, verse 13. John 16, verse 13 says that, how be it, uh, when he, the spirit is truth has come, he will guide us into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but what shall he shall hear, that shall he speak and he will show you things to come. So John chapter 16, verse 13, the spirit is going to lead us and guide us into all truth. Matthew chapter seven and verse three, it says, and, and why beholdest thou the mote that is in your brother's eye and consider is not the beam that is in your own eye. So from Matthew chapter seven, again, we don't study again to try to prove someone wrong. There are many times in which we want the other person to be able to get it. The other person to be able to, uh, well, man, they can only understand and grasp this. That is not the purpose and reason why we go into study. We study to be able to be intelligent in regards of our faith, certainly, to be able to share, but to always to be able to do it in a way that's going to be befitting and to win souls to Jesus Christ. I remember when I was uh, probably no more than 14 years old, when I was doing a um, work, doing Bible work, and I came across um, a, a, a Jehovah's Witness a gentleman, and he was on this porch, older guy. I was on his porch, and uh, it was Martinsville, Virginia. And I knew that Jehovah's Witnesses taught that it was okay to drink wine. And so I, you know, I knew my Bible text. You know, had a Proverbs 20: Wine is a mocker, strong drink is rage, and whosoever is a seed thereby is not wise. Proverbs chapter 23. You know, Isaiah chapter 63. Uh, Matthew. Uh, I had all these different texts that I knew. And so um, he was there on sitting on the porch, and I was there behind the gate. And we were talking, exchanging somehow just uh, from uh, from an interaction. And so we started talking about wine. Somehow we got in the conversation of wine. I don't know how we got there, but uh, I don't remember it now. But I remember, I was like, okay, well, I'm going to, this is my time to wear him out. Okay, he, he's talking about the wine is, is acceptable. But I know that the, what the Bible says. It says that wine is a mockery. So I'm just, you know, splitting out text after text. You know, one, he'll come up with this one and boom. It's like, okay, you know, every text he brought brings up, I'm refuting it, you know, and so forth. And, and, and he's getting agitated and worked up so much so that now he's beginning to, um, you know, like frothy and becoming red uh, and, and, and hot and angry in this conversation that we have. You know, I, I used all the texts and from a perspective in terms of countering and scoring points, I think I probably won that effect of no one that argument because it couldn't refute what I shared. I mean, I gave all the texts, you know, we went into the Greek and so everything. I mean, it was like, no. Nah, Nothing was spared in me being able to share. I won the argument. I was able to prove the point. But I violated a principle of scripture where Jesus said, you know, you, you got to do it in the, in the spirit of love. You see, on that day, it was about me trying to display what I knew and being able to, to enlighten this person. But it wasn't from a perspective of uh, of, of a mission of, of salvation for the person it was really just to prove a point so I knew my Bible and you weren't going to be able to, to, you know, talk some nonsense to me because I certainly knew it. Jesus said, don't try to get the, the beam, out of, uh, the little splinter out of someone's eye and you got a big beam that's in yours. So we studied the scripture again, not reading it. I'm not reading it because I want sister, Sharon to understand this and to be able to get this. Ooh, that she could just understand and hear this. This is just for her. If brother, you know, Joe, ooh, if he could just get this, this is for him. Yeah. But rather it's internal. What, what am I able to get from it? What, what does it mean? That's again, what is the interpretation? What is it um, it's saying? And now how am I going to be able to now apply this to my life? Because if I'm, as James says, you know, that we look into the law, to the mirror and we go back away um, and we haven't made any type of change, then you know, why, why, what is the purpose? What is the function? You know, not to leave us in a worse state, but to draw us 
and a closer state. So as we search the scriptures again, that is the purpose of it. As we're reading, it's the purpose of being able to understand, to learn, and to grow. Second Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1, the last text here, it says that this is the third time I'm coming unto you, and I'm off of two or three witnesses. Let every thing be established or let every word be established. And so then when we're studying the scriptures there, we want to make sure that it confirms with other passages of scripture. Okay. Uh, one place doesn't highlight take the place of the other, but we want to be able to see is there the harmony and the consistency of it contained and revealed throughout the scriptures? Is it given there completely? And if we do that, then certainly we're going to be able to come to uh, to a safe conclusion um, that, that is there of what the scriptures are talking about. Now, the two terms, of course, that we look at when we're studying the Bible. Uh, one is uh, eisegesis and one is exegesis. And eisegesis is really that we make the scriptures say what we want it to say. And, and exegesis is another term that you'll come across. Is, is Okay, well, it's really the interpreter. We're trying to understand what, what did God want it to say to us. Let me give a couple of examples really quick. Okay, so uh, the exegesis we talk about, that's just like the interpretation of a text. And somebody say, well, I, I didn't go to school. We don't have to go to school to be able to, to get this. And that's not my point. My point is just to be able to have tools that each one of us can use and to understand. Um, it's really just looking at the text and understanding the context that it's written in. You know, so we start reading the Bible. Um, we start reading uh, Corinthians. We start reading some Psalms and so forth. It helps us to be able to get a better understanding, certainly, if we look back and to see, well, uh, like for Psalms 23, for instance, well, what was it like in the times of a shepherd? You know, what, what, would, uh, what was it like in Bible times? So certainly different books you may be able to read in terms of Bible times, you know, understanding Bible dictionaries, commentaries, and so forth. Um, have the Bible there to be able to look at it, and even um, other versions to see and compare how does the scripture um, explain there, how is it brought to light? As we understand and see the times in which they live, we understand, okay, well, when, when David's talking about being a shepherd, certainly going to be a lot different than being a 21st century shepherd. When they're talking about riding a boat, it's going to, there are some similarities that are going to pass down from time to time, even from thousands of years ago to now, but certainly there'll be a lot of differences in between the two. A vine dresser, similar things from uh, handed down through antiquity, but certainly some things have changed. But what is the idea that's there? And then that paints the backdrop to be able to give a clearer understanding of it, but not only understanding it, um, because that's the vital part is getting the uh, the interpretation. What does it mean? But from there, now I'm able to draw up the application. What does the application mean for me? So now, this is what it said. Now, how am I going to apply this to my life? All right. Uh, so when we look at the eisegesis point, then uh, we see that that's a kind of you're reading into the text, making it say something uh, that that is not really saying to make the point. Uh, are imposing our own ideas into the text uh, to make it make it happen. Now, please note uh, that this could be done in ignorance. Doesn't mean that I'm doing it on purpose, uh, but ultimately, this undermines the authority of the scripture. Because when we're sharing, we want to be able to um, to look at well, what is what is the scripture saying, and what is the interpretation? What's the application to help you and me to be a better man? help you and me to be a better woman, help you and me to be a better father, help you and I to be a better church member, to help you and I be a better Christian, a better believer. What's the, this is what it says. Now I want to apply this over into my life to be able to grasp and to be able to grow with it and to understand. All right. There are warnings that are given to us. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, sorry, 2 Timothy chapter 4, um, verse 2 through 4. Paul writes, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn their ears away from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. Okay. I shared that in the whole basis of what we talked about is so that we can understand how we're to be able to approach and to search the scriptures. Because what I see taking place in, in the church and seeing in the world at large uh, is that, that many are, are not looking at the basis of, of scripture. That we're heaping to ourselves teachers having itching ears. 
Now, I know what you, uh, what, what most would think when they read that text in Second Timothy chapter four. Oh, that's talking about how the uh, the, the 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 world that they will want to gravitate to certain teachers. I'm talking about how many of the first day brethren they want to you know to to have teachers. Uh, because they have itching ears, they want to hear something uh, new. But, but keep in mind that the, what the text is talking about are a couple different things. So one, uh, one, when you go back to Second Second Timothy chapter four. So if you turn back in your Bibles, because I don't have it on the screen uh, to be able to look at. But Second Timothy chapter four, um, look at the warning that Paul is actually addressing in that what he has given. Second Timothy chapter four. Second Timothy chapter four. He says uh, that he, I charge you, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who would judge the quick and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom. Preach the word. Preach the word. This is what Paul is saying to Timothy. You have to preach the word. Don't preach your opinion. Don't preach a conspiracy. Don't preach an idea that cannot be substantiated by the word. Preach the word. in season and out of season, whether it's popular, whether it's unpopular, whether it's in vogue, whether it's out of fashion, whether people consider it old fashioned, whether they think this is a rigid and wrong or just an old archaic way of thinking, that cannot influence you, it cannot persuade you. Preach the word, that's an imperative, you preach the word. There's enough in the word, again, where we don't need to go in to give our opinions, we don't preach our own tastes, we don't share our, uh, our own likes and our own dislikes, but we preach the word, the unadulterated word. Let the word be spoken. And Jesus said that I, if I be lifted up, then I will draw men into myself. So preach the word, Timothy, in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. It's not going to be easy in what I am bidding you to do as a young, a young apostle. But I want you to preach the word because this is how success will be reached. You preach the word. It says, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. So again, now keep in mind, and uh, with what we talked about before within our context, right? Within the context of what he's talking about, this isn't an appeal that's talking about to, to the world, okay? That's how we generally apply it. I say, you know, we make that up, oh, we're just talking about the world. The world will not endure sound doctrine. This is what the idea is. But we talked about before, again, text without context is pretext with subtext. So we're true to the, to the, to the flow of the scripture, He's telling Timothy to preach the word to his congregation. Upbuild them, reprove them, exhort them. You know, uh, if they're doing something wrong, let them know this is what's wrong. This is what God would expect of us. And so God will empower us to be able to do it. Exhort them, encourage them along the way, because it is not always easy. Sometimes you have those days in which you, you, you may feel like you want to throw in the towel. Well, exhort you. Hang on. Uh, exhort you, God is still with you. Exhort you, God is still embrace you. We're almost there. We're almost at the finish line. Have patience toward them um, and bring them doctrine. Why? For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. So who is he talking about? Is he talking about the time will come which the world will not endure sound doctrine? No. Nah. Mm -mm. Literally, he's talking about the, the folks that he is ministering to. And certainly we know then that the, the time down the road, we, this will be an a, a, uh, application then to the elect, okay, to the church, to the believers. Because he's not addressing unbelievers, he's addressing believers. Preach the word because the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. The time will come in which they will not want sound doctrine. Notice what else he says. But will heap to themselves teachers having itching ears okay so they will not want the pure unadulterated word that won't be enough of them the word will not be enough the word will not be sufficient they'll want something new something tantalizing, something that is uh, that is fanciful this is what they will want they will not want to endure sound doctrine but they're going to go to find teachers that they will heap to themselves having itching ears meaning not only do they want to continue to hear things that are uh, that are erroneous but they are wanting to hear what they want to hear so it's, 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 it'd be like this, you know, if you want Mexican food, you don't go to a Chinese restaurant that only serves Chinese, okay? If you want Italian food, you don't go to an American restaurant where the American restaurant only specializes and sells American uh, entrees. But you're gonna go to an Italian restaurant, you're gonna go to a Mexican or whatever the case may be. Why? Because that's what your palate wants, that's what you're being driven by, that's what you desire. And so he's telling us that, listen, the time is gonna come 
in which they won't want sound Bible doctrine. But they're going to go to go to places where they can continue to hear what they want to hear because they are turning away from the basis of truth. They're turning away from the basis of the scripture. They don't want that. It says, and notice it doesn't say that they cannot endure sound doctrine, but they will not. It's not that it's impossible to be received, but they're not interested in being able to receive it because what they want to hear as not necessarily smooth things, exclusively smooth things, but it's just things that uh, won't challenge them and their way of thinking. Things that won't challenge them to be able to lift up the cross of Jesus Christ. Uh, things that will will, uh, in, will embrace their ideology and what they've already established and what they're fo following through and, go and going by. So this is not an admonition that is given to the world because the world has never been interested in the doctrine of Jesus Christ. Jesus said that from, from ancient times, you know, from the, uh, the kingdom of heaven has suffered violence and the violence take it, violent, take it by force. The world has never been interested in the gospel of Jesus Christ from the days of Cain all the way into now. But this is an issue that would impact and come upon the church, the people of God in the end of time, that they will not endure sound doctrine. It says they will turn away from the truth and they're going to be turned to fables. They're turning away from the truth to turn to fables. And so today we're in a state in which many are turning away from just the plain teaching of God's word and they're going into fables. A lot of fanciful interpretations, a lot of ideas that are out there that sound good, that seem reasonable, but they're not based upon the Bible. They're not based upon evidence. They're not based upon uh, plain logic and reason of scripture and inspiration. But they're based upon fables. And the Bible says that we have not followed cunningly devised fables and we've told it to you uh, about the kingdom of God. But we were eyewitnesses of his majesty and of his glory. But beyond that, you know, we heard the voice out of the mount. But, but beyond even hearing the voice out of the mount, we have a more sure word of prophecy is what Peter ends up telling So in our searching of the scriptures, what is the basis of it for? It is to keep us, is to introduce us to Jesus as to who he is, to help to lighten the pathway for others as well, and to keep us in the hour of temptation, because the time will come. And I believe that the time is vastly approaching, that we're in it, but it is vastly approaching and coming upon us that men and women won't want sound doctrine, but they won't fables. You ask, well, what is the evidence to base it on? Because the Bible tells us in 2 Timothy chapter 2, hey, with, with all of us, uh, in meekness and fear, we ought to be able to give the hope that lies within us with meekness and fear, being able to share it from, from the word. Well, why are we coming up with that? Well, hey, this is where we come from from that. And again, bear in mind that, that no truth loses um, uh, its purity by the investigation. Okay, So meaning, or paraphrasing it another way, um, that, that the investigation of a truth doesn't cause that to be an untruth, but it gives us the opportunity to be able to look at it and to, to explore it. Truth loses nothing by investigation. So when we look at it, it may be something that, okay, um, it's no evidence for it. It's not based, not based in the, based upon evidence. So I'll reject that claim because I want to be a Bible believing Christian. Well, there is, I investigated and it's based upon the Bible. I want to receive that because I want to be a Bible believing Christian. But I don't want to join up uh, amongst the mass that just follows off of what sounds like that's feasible. It sounds like that that could be logical because truth is not based upon reason, but truth is based upon truth itself. And I think our, I think our time uh, may be up. Uh, so uh, the last text I'll give then is 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 26. First Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 26, he says, How is it then, brethren, that when you come together, that everyone hath the psalm, hath the doctrine, hath the tongue, and hath the revelation, hath an interpretation, that all things be done unto edifying? When we read that normally, we talk about in First Corinthians chapter 14, the book of corrections, Paul is correcting them. Uh, and he's talking about the gifts that are in the church. And when in particular he's talking about the gift of tongues here, that we don't come in and multiple people are you know, speaking in tongues. At most is one person, and then there is an interpreter and so forth. But we often bypass over what he said. You know, look, he said, 
the, the way we, we've been, the way you've been carrying on, not we, the way you've been carrying on uh, is what he's saying. This isn't according to the mind of God, because God's given us uh, not the spirit of confusion, but God is the author of, of peace and of order. And he says, that why when you come together that everybody have their own psalm, everyone have their own tongue, everyone have their own doctrine? Well, uh, think of that for a moment. How is it then that everyone has their own opinion on a matter? And that doesn't mean um, uniformity. Unity does not mean uniformity. You know, uh, it, but, but essentially, essentially, though, we ought to be established and united in the truth of God. And in this particular case, what he's talking about um, here is that they have all these different uh, sundry beliefs. When there's a simple truth that is given there, how can we then have all these different beliefs? Well, we can get them when we start letting the word slip from its rightful place. And then we allow tradition to be able to take its place. We begin to allow um, opinions from different men, women to take its place. We begin to look to people to be the, the source of truth and inspiration and don't let God through his word be the source of truth and the source of inspiration. So uh, my challenge for us as we close today then is to, to get back into the word, to let God's word be our guide. Let his word be what we seek to understand as we read it, uh, not for the benefit of, of others, but primarily reading it for the benefit of ourselves. That, that by beholding and reading it, that we may be un to understand it and to apply its changeless message to our lives by the grace of God and through the power of his Holy Spirit. And that by so doing, that we might fortify our minds uh, with the truth of God so that as overwhelming and almost uh, masterful delusions take place, that we might be built upon that rock uh, that does not sweep away. Let us, uh, let's pray as we uh, close our section of this program. So if you'd kneel with me for those who uh, may be able as we pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we want to come to you and to just pray for um, your mercy, for your grace again in our lives. We're talking about studying your word and, and um, we sometimes don't give it the proper attention that we should. And we pray that you please forgive us uh, for that. Um, we, we haven't meant to, but we just allow ourselves to, uh, to become engrossed in other things uh, that are sometimes important, but, but are not as important as, as this of being able to know you through your word. And so I pray, God, that you might reveal yourself to us individually and collectively through the searching of the scriptures. We don't want to read to be able to build ourselves up from the uh, point of ego and pride. But we want to read that um, more than anything, we can be broken down and so that you can build us up, that we may reflect your image and your glory, your grace and the power to others. Uh, your word is such a powerful uh, uh, living book uh, that it has the power to be able to bring forth life from the dead, the power to be able to give us holiness, the power to transform our lives. And so we ask for, uh, for the, the power of your word to be unleashed in us. We also pray, Father, that you would please help us to understand it. Um, and to interpret it and apply it to our lives uh, as you as you would want us to. And we know that we are living in the end uh, times. And so I pray that you'd help us to, uh, to not get caught off guard, uh, to fortify our minds with the scriptures and to not follow in fables, uh, the teachings and erroneous doctrines of men, but to be established upon your truth. Again, we thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your grace always in Jesus' name.